What's up? What's up? What's up? Salute. Salute. February Black History Month. Mm hmm. Mm. Yippee. Ooh. Ooh. Get you right here. <laughs> yes. Mm. What's up, y'all? Yeah. What's that? Happy Hump Day. Oh, it is Hump Day. Yes, it, it is. is Hump Day. Shit. Show y'all got the hump? <laughs> she out front. I think she watching. Depends on what time this pot ends. <laughs> <laughs> well. Yeah, gotta keep True. it real. <laughs> True. Ooh. Hey Sam. Ooh. Oh shit! I got to share. There the, she I is. Got, I got to share the goddamn pod. There she is. There. Miss there. America. Go Sam. So what's up, Trey? How you been? How you week been? Uh, it's been pretty good. Pretty good. Uh, Mondays, Tuesdays, and Wednesdays are my weekends. So going back uh-huh. to work tomorrow. Oh man, so you work Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday? Yeah. Ooh. I I have <laughs> hold on. Hold on. Cause I, I've worked customer service for 20 plus years now. And mm. I for the first time in my life, I actually work somewhere that I enjoy working. Okay. Um, I am doing customer service, but Merv said, looking- damn, those jobs exist. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no. Hey. It only took you me 20 years to find one. <laughs> <laughs> but uh no, I uh I I I work I work managing the shop portion of a tattoo tattoo parlor. Oh, okay. So as customers come in with their ideas and what they'd like to see happen, I'm I'm the one that sits behind the desk and jumps on the computer, finds images and builds a stencil for them and and helps that helps them realize what they're wanting on them. So oh, oh. I, I get a piece of, of being able to help people do that. That's dope. So you have to be able to draw to do that? Uh, Thankfully, no, because I will mess up a stick man. He'll have scoliosis, <laughs> a wavy arm, and an oval head if no, I sir. have to draw. <laughs> so. That is not the tattoo I came in here for, sir. I need a manager. Exactly. <laughs> Exactly. So uh, there, there's three artists in the shop that I work in, but all I do is I put the stencil, I put the components of the tattoo together on Photoshop and I layer them correctly. And I do the editing and, and put in whatever font or uh, words they want in there. And, and I print out the stencil, size and form. I do all the estimates. But I mean, I get to joke with people and, and interact with people yeah the whole time i'm there and i really enjoy getting to to do that with people because i mean it it i like to look at it as i'm putting in two percent of the total hundred percent of a piece of art that somebody's going to carry with them the rest of their life Mm -hmm. that's the point that's actually where it starts yeah so i i enjoy it that's what's up i sell clean urine for a living Okay. <laughs> that, that's major. That's major that's big, right there. I drink so much water. I should sell. I, I, that's a joke. It's a joke, y'all. But I really. No, it's somebody, not. Somebody was like, "No, you really should do that." I was like, "How the hell?" It's not I a joke, y'all. How would I successfully and do that? You yeah. know, keeping you know sanitary p- procedures in order. Because if, like, if there are women who can market and sell successfully their bath water or their mm-hmm. breast milk that that's another one women do that's hygienic it has a purpose i would never mm. do that you would not see me drinking nobody else's breast milk or feeding it to my baby that's ridiculous no that's no. absolutely ridiculous hey whatever it can be there young but that's a yuck for me dog but they make mad money though. Like if you Google, just I just random Google stuff, right? How how much do women make selling their breast milk? They make like a lot. We need like, a whole podcast and nothing but your search history. <laughs> right. <Listen. laughs> Y'all can't have mine. I'm telling you right now. Mm-mm. 
Mm, yeah, mine is thirteen thousand a month. Women makes more than thirteen thousand a month selling her breast milk. Damn. Damn. Right. Thirteen thousand a month selling breast milk. Yes, selling hey, breast hey, milk. Hey. Growing. It says growing <laughs> sales of breast milk during hey, the hey. pandemic. Hey, hey, baby. Damn. <laughs> I need shit. I need to get pregnant. Hey, baby. <laughs> fuck. That's what the fuck? Yo, let me tell you. Hey, I'm about to say something, right? Before we get before we get in the positive light, I want to say something real ratchet. <laughs> if you're a fucking woman, you should never be broke. Bro. <laughs> and you should never go with no. I just found out you can sell breast milk for thirteen thousand dollars a month. Yes. Listen. Look, oh my god. That listen. is a legitimate business. Mur. Hey, listen. Hold on. Let me let me get this ratchet shit out before we go positive. <laughs> if you're a woman, if you can sell breast milk, you can sell breast milk up to $13,000 $13, a month and you can sell pussy. <laughs> you <laughs> should never go without anything Mur. if you're Mur. a fucking woman. Hold, hold up a second. Mur, hold up a second. That's just milk. Do you know eggs right. go That's for nine grand a piece? What what? Eggs? Oh yeah, that's right. You can sell viable eggs. eggs. Yeah, nine thousand dollars a piece, and you can carry a baby for someone. Yes, you can. They make twenty to twenty five, thirty thousand, depending on who it is, and if it's a celebrity, you can you can charge even more. Mm. Holy shit! Whoever had Kim K's baby, I'm sure got paid buku money. I, no, still getting paid. Because part of that will include an NDA. So if you want me to shut up about carrying your baby, you got to pay me. 60 G's. Still please. getting paid. 60 K, please. Yep. Thank they, you. They pull in at least 15 K a month on that one. Just to they keep pay, the game out quiet. They're paying for all medical bills. They're paying for sometimes housing, depending on... If the person that you really, really want doesn't live close by or you want to just, you know, watch them because oh, a lot of that is bonding. Like, y'all know Candy Burris, right, from Escape? Yeah. She had a surrogate yeah. also. She chose a surrogate local so that she can go and rub the baby. Her and Todd will go rub the baby, talk to the baby. They went to every single doctor's visits with the surrogate. So that way the baby can get used to their energy, their voices, and things like that. So when she gave birth to the baby the baby wouldn't be foreign to them right yeah. and the and the woman that gave that had candy's burris's baby now is a consultant for other surrogates yes. and she's made, a, really? she's made a bit candy candy because you know candy's all about her money mm -hmm. she has promoted she's like i'm not, I'm not trying to sell my surrogate to y'all because she's mine but she has a legitimate business and now she consults women about how to how to properly eat, exercise, and make their bodies right in, in case they want to be somebody's surrogate. What to do, yeah. what to not do. Yes. So, yes, ladies. What, what'd you do. say, Merv? <laughs> she would never, never be broke. <laughs> never. <laughs> God. But men Damn. can do it too. Men can sell. Now, I don't know how much y'all make from selling y'all sperm, but. It's not as much as we make, but still. No. Can no. Too. Wait, we can sell our sperm? It, it's just like being yeah. in a bar. Yeah. <laughs> How much the market is flooded well, you and think, therefore the well, price is down. You think Judy, Judy pregnant? She's, she's a lesbian. Somebody got her pregnant with a sperm. I'm sure I'm sure they went to a sperm bank and you could you could get paid for that. Shit, yeah, but like I said, the market hey. is flooded. Therefore, the price has gone down. So it's saturated. Exactly. It's like 50 to 100 bucks if you are yeah. selected. And I give you even more discount if you let me just um, donate naturally. <laughs> Listen, there are body parts that we have. Look, he is shaking his head. This is a weird conversation, but anyway. There are body parts that you can sell that you are able to live without having. No, I'm not doing that. I'm not doing that. I'm not doing I'm, I'm, you could be a I'm donor, not, you, know, you could not sell it like you no, know, like cash at me, no, and I'm, I'm not give you my that. I'm not, it's, I'm not it's selling a, anything that doesn't automatically rep reproduce. I so I'll, I'll sell sperm, I'll sell uh pee and saliva. 
What would somebody do with your solo album, Merv? I'm scared to well, ask. I'm just saying, I can reproduce that. So I'll sell that to you. Look, don't nobody want anything to do with my internal organs except for a scientist. Here, Here you go, Merv. You can sell it as a natural natural lubricant. There we go. As a natural lubricant? You can yes, sell your body to a corpse farm. To, what? I'm dead. You can sell your saliva as natural lubricant. Water-based. <laughs> I don't know. True. If you look, if you look up corpse farms, you can actually sell your body before your death, Merv. You can sell your body to them. They give you the money ahead of time, and your body gets turned over to them after your demise. Can the person have like a funeral first and have an official all of that so for the family before the body gets donated? Not with the body present, because the body doesn't belong to the family. Oh. Wow. Well, I do know that you could pay for your funeral while you're still alive. I do know that. Exactly. I know that too. Because what are you talking about? My mother about? does. My mother actually does that. And when she told me about it, I was I was slightly like, why are you telling me this? Like, second, why are you even thinking about this? But I, I understood once we started talking about it, I understood why she was like, I don't want I don't want y'all to, to go broke burying me. So I'm going to set this money aside now. And I'm like, well, why are you thinking about you dying? But then again, you never know. So, but yes, you can. So there are many, many other ways to, to get money besides PPP loans and selling your ass and, and um, Pornhub and OnlyFans. You can do all this while you're alive. <laughs> Anybody watching, you want to go Fansly. You don't want to go OnlyFans. Fansly only takes half the percentage that OnlyFans does. Don't ask me. This is, not up for discussion. <laughs> this is not up for discussion or consideration. Thank you. <laughs> oh, you probably did a Google search, right? Yeah. It's, 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 I it's, might or might know some hey, folk. That's all only, I'm saying. Is, is OnlyFans owned by black people? No. no. Okay, we ain't talking about them no more rest of the night. <laughs> <laughs> but um isn't isn't um what's that other what the other website not not Pornhub, the other one hip oh man i forgot what it, it used to originally be fight videos a lot world star like, hip-hop world star hip-hop isn't that black owned yes it is aha uh -huh. they ain't black excellence though they got an it's ratchet, <laughs> ratchet as hell black. that's not black excellence <laughs> You don't, you don't know that. You don't know that. Go to the website. Hey. Go, to the, go to the Ebony section and you never know what you can find. Look. Nah. <laughs> World Star takes the worst of the community right. and tries to reinvest the money it makes off the worst of the community to try to make the community better. They are, they are a music label. They... <laughs> The funniest thing I've ever seen is a gospel album produced and released by World Star Hip Hop. Not the Snoop Dogg one. <laughs> the hell? The yeah, the gospel album. I, but before Yay. Yeah, but you wouldn't expect a gospel album to come off Death Row Records either. Well, <laughs> I mean, when you die, you want to go to heaven, so I, I see the connection. Yeah. Shit, I don't want nothing to do with heaven. He wanted to do with dollar bills. <laughs> and they say all dog, they say all dogs go to heaven. They sure do. <laughs> yeah, now that it belongs to Snoop again. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. dope, though. That is dope that he does have that. I think that's yeah. a, that, is, that is a full circle moment. Yeah, right. The record label that signed him, put him on. Then decades later, he ended up being the owner of the. That, now that's black excellence. That is black. We excellence. can talk about that. That that. That's black excellence. And if any of the financial rumors are true, with him acquiring Death Row Records, he also got a lot of the firsts from those albums back and the rights to them. Like the masters? Yes. Hmm. Nice. So well, if any if the rumor that? that's if the rumors are to be tr are true. But uh yeah. Um there are quite a few of the the copyright um copyrights that he now owns to a lot of death rose earlier music mm. okay interesting uh, he's, 
You bought Death Row just to get some of that chronic back. <laughs> yeah, but <laughs> but I'm literally, literally and figuratively. Right. But I'm bump. <laughs> So, what we doing tonight, Murray? What, what you got on the, on the timeline? What you gonna be dealing with? Yo, so we're gonna talk about um, we're gonna talk about Black history and Black excellence. We already talked about a little about Black excellence with Snoop Dogg buying um, Death Row Records. Um, so but we're gonna go back to the, <clears throat> we're gonna go back go back in time a little bit. We're just gonna hit you with hit y'all. We'll start with timelines. Um, some of the some of the timelines might strike a nerve. We want to curse a motherfucker out. Um, <laughs> some of it, some of it's going. You want going want to speak on? Um, do me a favor, Becca. Pull out your Google because some of this stuff is you're not gonna remember everything. You may want to hit the quick Google real quick. Just, just um, I got you. All right. All right. Yes, sir. <laughs> they don't need Google. He's he's a he's he got everything. He got everything and his goddamn brain. That motherfucker don't need. <laughs> he don't need shit. Y'all been talking to Heisen, huh? <laughs> yeah, we <laughs> used to hate our conversations sometimes, but yeah. yeah. All right, so let's let's go ahead and start. Let's all go. right, black Black History milestones timeline. All right, so start. Um, and just American. All right, before somebody come in talking about it's more we talking about American Black. We history were kings and queens in, in America. America. God damn it. <laughs> Um, so, so slavery camp comes to North America all the way back to 1619. That's, um, what's that? How many years? A lot of years years. ago. Huh? A lot of years ago. Yeah, a lot, yeah, a lot of years ago. We're 2022 right now. Mm -hmm. What's that, four or three? Is that, is that? Yeah, that's That's the count I got on it. Yeah, so 43 years ago. Yo, that's when um, yeah, <laughs> that's when that's when we came over. That, that's when black people was brought up here and slavery started. 400, 400, 403 years ago, y'all. Three years ago. So we're not that old. Uh, yeah, yeah. We're not nah, that old over here. Nah, hell no. Um in 18 well, it's a little bit out of all right, 1793. That was a rise of the uh cotton industry. Mm. That that I think should fall under black excellence. Huh? I, I think the rise of the cotton industry, one, first of all, it was the rise of the cotton industry was predicated on, on the backs uh, of, of black slaves. Um, uh-huh. The rise of the cotton industry as being the first, we'll say, major industrial industry in the United States. Is yeah. also because of a black man. Oh well, many but oh the okay, cotton yeah. gin, right, mm-hmm. right. So uh, the 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 fact that it was predicated through American black slavery, and it took a black, it took an American black slave to take the entire United States and. And in, in, in my personal opinion, that was the one of the first seeds sown to make the United States a world power because we were actually ahead of everybody else because of it, the invention of a black slave. We ended up being the, the top of the heap as far as cotton production, being able to get it out faster, being able to grow it faster, seed it faster, being able to to actually turn it into a material that the textile industry could use. Um, Had it not been for slavery, not had it not been for slavery, um, had it not been for Eli Whitney's uh, invention invention mm-hmm. and the fact that because a black slave created it it then became instead of unfortunately instead of being uh profited off of and and, and limited it was how to make one what was the necessary means to make one became mm-hmm. public knowledge in america there was okay. no patent to deal with it 
because the patent belonged to his owner, not him. Oh, uh, gotcha. All right. So I, I think that's that was one of the first seeds sown that created the superpower that, that America became eventually. Gotcha. And people still pick cotton as a job. Whites and blacks. True. Okay. All right, so we'll go to our next timeline that we have. Quick question. If you are a black person right now and your job was picking cotton, how how would you explain that to somebody? I have no fucking idea. I think there's a bunch of rights and lefts that would get used to stop uh, any jokes. (laughs) I get it. (laughs) Right. (laughs) <laughs> I, uh, I've always, always thought about that. Like we, you know, we do have a we have a a, a, a bad history with, with with picking cotton, but it is still a necessary thing, right? And people still do it. And I'm sure there's black people right now that pick cotton as their job. Yeah. And see that I I truly see that as being a national issue, and mm-hmm. because that was one of the that was because of the the leaps and bounds that the United States took in the cotton industry. I I can see why that's a central joke, but Mm -hmm. cotton picking is not so bad. It's, it's just as bad as it is everywhere else, but you could catch a whole bunch of lefts and rights in South Carolina, North Carolina, Tennessee, Kentucky, and Virginia. If you talk about start sending somebody out to pick, uh, tobacco, yeah, because that was the big that was the big uh, crop in those areas. Okay, and they feel more offended by being called, being told, or having jokes cracked about them picking tobacco than they picking and pick processing cotton. tobacco than they do about okay. cotton. All right. I actually found that out when I was thirteen, living in North Carolina. It was it was the one of the weirdest conversations I'd ever been in. Mm-hmm. All right. <laughs> well, let's go ahead with um to the next timeline that we have in um a Black History timeline in America is, is 1831. Um, Nat Turner's Revolt, August mm. 1831. Um, mm. I think they got a movie about this, right? They do. Yes. And it was it was very hard to see. I walked out of the theater watching this movie. Okay. Was yeah. that Mississippi Burning? No, not Mississippi Burning. It's um the guy that made um American. He was Sin. in the Great Debate. He was in the, the Great Debate also. Yeah, he's also guy that the guy that produced um, um uh what's the what's the American damn skin shit. Hold the, on, one that Spike, the one that Spike Lee inter- um helped produce. His name is Nate Parker. Yeah, Nate yeah, Parker. Yeah, Nate Parker. Yeah, he produced uh, the, he produced the movie. The Birth of a Nation. Birth, the Birth of a of Nation. nation. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, so that, that movie that, was tough to see. I, I couldn't watch it. That's based on Nat Turner's Revolt, August 1831. Um, yeah. Also, uh, <clears throat> abolitionism and the Underground Railroad was established in 1831 as well. Mm. All right. Um, in 1857, uh, there's a Dred Scott case, March 6, 1857. So what that was, Dred Scott ended up making to um, up north, and he was on free land. So they end up, so you know, they end up sending somebody to catch him, bring him back, and he tried to sue, saying that he's on free land now. He's been mm-hmm. on free land, touch free land, so he's no longer a slave. And yeah. in that court case, he lost it. They were saying, well, he was considered a property. So property don't have rights. So you're not able to sue. Yep. That's what the dress got came It was for. it was he was trying to he was trying to get um freedom for him, his wife, and his two daughters. Um, and he lost that case. Yeah. All right. In 1861, um the Civil War and Emancipation in 1861. Civil War and Emancipation, I think. I think one of the big hits that we take in in the Civil War and the Emancipation is Lincoln's decision to free the slaves was 
more of a political and a war tactic. Mm-hmm. I, I think the fact that a lot of people look at it as, oh, yeah. uh, Lincoln was just trying, Lincoln was trying to do the right thing. No, he wasn't. Yeah, like he it, really it was, cared about us. It, it was so, it, psychological warfare. It was, it was psychological warfare at its best. Yeah, the as war far as we're concerned, everybody that you have with you is now a potential ally to us because we are going to free them from their bonds and we are going to let them stay where they are. Yep. The, um, it started the original reason for the Civil War was because the Southern states wanted to succeed and Lincoln wanted to keep everything. He didn't like the fact that them breaking up the nation. So the main thing he wanted was to keep everybody together, but it was just the fact that the the slavery was not being let go, and kept being an issue, 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 issue. Now I'm, I'm gonna say something, and I know that both of y'all are gonna want to smack the shit out of me. No, but I'm gonna say it. And I'm gonna explain myself. I'm progressive. Since when? When? <laughs> In any of these idiots that sit there and tell you that the Civil War was over states' rights, you are absolutely 100% correct. However, the states' rights that they were fighting for was to not be taxed on any materials or textiles that were being produced in the South and moved above the Mason-Dixon line and being sold. Because... They were against the tax because the tax leveled the playing field. You see, creation of textiles, creation of crops and creation of materials is a lot easier when you have a zero percent balance as far as labor is concerned. The the tax that was being levied by the northern states against the southern states were equal to that of what they would have paid had they were actually paying the slaves any kind of living wage or or anything to that effect. So yes, in essence, people who sit there and say the Civil War was over slaves' rights or was over states' rights, technically they're correct, but it was over the states' rights to not pay their, their workforce, ergo over slavery. And that that has right. always been one a point of contention as far as the civil war is concerned but yeah no that's, no that's correct um you give you know you just give you still give so let lincoln get credit because the fact that he actually went through with it true but, against but no, against his, his cabinet's recommendations uh, yeah you say against his staff recommendations, right? Against his staff and yes. his his command, Correct. his military command's recommendations. Correct. All right. So let's let's carry on. Let's see which one is this. Oh, thank that. Hold up. Um, that was two. Hold up. Mm, all right. So, all right. So we had the post-slavery South in 1865. That's a, the, after what we just talked about, the emancipation, right? Yeah. And then after that, it was the um separate but equal brown versus board of topeka in, in 1896 um huh, separate but equal yeah <laughs> and what is washington carver and dubois in 1900 yeah that's did um, they start the uh they they started the uh naacp and what was it 90, the, right uh, here one of the first centers for black excellence <laughs> Yeah, and that um, it was officially founded in 1909, but it started the brainstorm started right here with Washington Carver and Dubois. Um, became official NAACP came official in 1909. Um, That's when they started founding uh, historic or HBCUs. Mm, okay. Who's then in um, 1916, Marcus Garvey. Um and the UNIA, uh, Marcus Garvey, I think he was born in Jamaica, right? He came. Yeah, you. I'm sorry, you're right. Um, I'm you know I'm over here googling the first. Okay. It looks like the first HBCU was established. Wilberforce, 1856. Ah, nice. Isn't that where Obama went? 
the the first recognized HBCUs were. It says, yeah, first owned and operated HBCU Wilberforce yeah, she said was in Ohio, was founded Cincinnati Conference of the Methodist Episcopal Church and AME provides okay. classical education. So Wilberforce was the first official H HBCU? That's what it says, 1856, okay. the first black owned and operated HBCU, which is Wilberforce. Wilberforce. All right, cool. I think 1909 was the first uh, education centers for blacks. I remember something about George Washington Carver being uh, establishing the the first education centers. It might not have been HBCUs, but I do remember I do remember that following either shortly before or shortly after the uh, formation in NAACP. Yeah, because there's a couple there's a couple things here. They they had um, black. Um, establishments already like they had like i'm looking at cheney university in pennsylvania there was also thurgood marshall so there's also different like things that shaw university i'm looking at as well but i think there was a time when they fir was first established um i guess worldwide and that's what i'm that's what it's showing right now all right so let's keep going um marcus garvey came <clears throat> came to america um 1916 and he was his his philosophy or ideology have um have you want to um call it was for um blacks to go back to africa and get reestablished over there that was marcus garvey um that's what he was preaching very hard that was that was he what he was advocating um all right, 1920, we had the Harlem Renaissance. Birth and the buildup of jazz. Right. Yep. So, right, as uh, you see in the picture. Uh, a lot of that, I I, I have the, uh, had the fortunate opportunity to actually get to see a lot of that, uh, a lot of the physical remnants of that uh, in uh -huh. Kansas City, the uh, Kansas City Jazz and, uh, I mean, the Negro, the Negro League museums up there, uh, the Jazz Foundation for uh, the Jazz Foundation, which, as far as I'm concerned, that that is Black history, uh, is also mm -hmm. in Kansas City at 18th and Vine. And okay, you want to talk about amazing shows that they, they still have a bar front that does live shows and and they do the uh, Blues and Jazz Festival in Kansas City yearly because of it and just the amount of and, and i think probably one of the things that i i, I wanted to say about tonight there, there's a lot of great and wonderful moments uh in black history and black excellence that that have been mentioned but one thing that hasn't been brought up is the fact that one i think one of the strengths within black history is the fact that it has never primarily been written it has always been expressed through through song, through music, and and it, it's always been from its very roots. It was a word. It was word of mouth passed on from generation to generation. And okay. the, the Harlem Renaissance, I think, was the first time that I, I think 1920 in the in the rise of the Harlem Renaissance was the first time that that music, that that history, that was shared nationwide for the entire american black community because in, at until that point it had been segregated pockets where we were yeah. allowed to express our history our our way of life uh and and, and our for the it lack was, of it, was, it was it was cage it was caged Yes, it was, it was like a caged bird until the Harlem Renaissance came. Yes, the Harlem Renaissance was the first time that we actually got to express our ethnicity nationwide, and we got yep. to unite under that. Yep. All right. So the next thing on the timeline. Um, <clears throat> hold up. All right. So African Americans was in the World War Two in 1941. Um. In 1947, Jackie Robinson became the first black player um, for a major league sport. And we ain't looked back since. <laughs> nope. 
<laughs> nope. Uh, you can look at every record the MLB has. At this point, they all written in black and white. <laughs> every <laughs> single record. <laughs> all right. Let's see. Keep going. Um, Brown versus Board of Education happened on May 17th. 1954. Um, I don't know if they still do, but Topeka used to celebrate this every year. This oh, was really? actually a state holiday in Kansas. All schools got out for it. Okay. Wow. Um, so I'm gonna name the, the people in the picture because uh, they were vital to the Board of Education. Um, from the results from it were Vicki Henderson. Don <coughs> Linda Brown, uh, James Emanuel, Nancy Todd, and Catherine Carper. And that was originally based off of, because uh, the major argument that destroyed the separate but equal movement was separate was not equal when a white, when Ms. Brown had to walk past three different white schools just to get to hers. She had to actually go through some dangerous area, uh, had to uh cross over the railroad tracks that that was a, I, I remember the railroad tracks being a, a major argument in that that she actually had to cross uh railroad tracks that led into or yeah led into the railroad transit center in, on the i think it was the east side of topeka but she actually had to cross eight or nine different sets of tracks at times damn. dodging trains to get to school damn all right, let's do y'all think that we have people um in our in our area in our era that could have done some of this stuff? Do we have somebody right now that would have been able to have like do we have a Harriet Tubman right now? Like do we have somebody no. that will cross these eight tracks no. to Not, in my opinion, I'm gonna say yes. We do then we're Mm. I'm, I'm gonna say yes, and this is why I say yes, Merv. They didn't think that they had a Harriet Tubman then. That's that's All true. Right, so, okay, so let me tell you why I said. Let me tell you why I said no. Um, maybe someone, maybe we got someone that we got today's Brown Brown versus Board of Education, as far as like standing up and and going to the law or trying to use the courts but when you say harriet tubman i was only focused i only thought about harriet tubman yeah. and the things that harriet tubman uh, harriet harriet tubman did i don't see us having someone like what harriet tubman did specifically today because she made it out but only thing she could think about is everybody she left behind so she made it out and she reached back. She kept reaching back to get others, kept reaching back to get others, even though it risked her life. And it I seems like the more we evolve, the more selfish we have become. The more successful we've become, the more selfish we have become overall, I, I, dynamically as a people. I, I think with all of the protests that we've seen in the last two years, I, I think with all of the movement and mm -hmm at times violent uh, pro progress that we are trying to make now, I, I think that defeats the argument that we don't, that we're too selfish at this point. I, I think in the last two to three years, we've realized that we put up with a lot more because we kept getting fed equity instead of equality. Mm -hmm. it, it kept being for many many decades it has been okay we're going to give the black community breadcrumbs until they stop being the open mouth little birdies and i think a lot of the last two years has made people realize it's not about equity anymore i'm not looking to to have as much as you i'm looking to be seen as equal to you the, the yeah. biggest thing that that I've ever argued, uh, whether it's racial, whether it's uh, as far as the battle of the sexes is concerned, is simply this. 
Equity is when you have three children trying to look over a fence and the three children are three different heights. E equality is they get they each get a box that's the same height. Equity is they get a box that's big enough for them to see over the fence. Gotcha. And I think when we stop accepting equity, we will start fighting for equality. But I don't I don't know if equality is is if we're ever going to see it in our lifetime or if it's if it's even a real thing. And what I mean by that is a lot of the times when people want equality, if everyone was to be equal, things would be very uneven, if that makes sense. So if 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 women want to be as equal as men, there are going to be some things that we're just not going to be able to do. Right. Physically, okay. let's just say physically. If I want to be as equal as you and pick up that brick, I may not be able to pick up that brick. I will not be equal to you. It doesn't. It, that's a that's a small example, but that may not be a real thing. Sometimes, what you really don't want is equality. You might just want a privilege. So you, no. it, it's very, it's very different. I don't, I don't, I don't know if, if what people think equality is, is what they really want. Now, my argument for that is I can do things better than you. I can do some things better than you. You can do some things better than me. If we're both trying to reach toward, towards equality, what you're better at, you can cover down for me. And what I'm better at, I can cover down for you. So it's not so much achieving equality that makes society a better place. It's striving towards equality that will make society a better place. Okay. So, so basically the opportunity, the opportunity for Becca to pick up that brick if yes. she wanted to. If she wanted to, if she, if she wanted gotcha. to get to the point where she could. Gotcha, okay. Now, also in that metaphor, it's my responsibility to do everything that I can do to make sure Becca learns what she needs to learn to be able to pick up that brick. Cause I already know how to pick up that brick. That's the difference. Okay. And I think that's what exists in black history and in black excellence. And that's why if everything was equal, it would be unequal. Cause I do understand what Becca means by that. Mm -hmm. Because when you for generations have had to do 120, 130, 200% just to be considered equal. If every, if everybody wakes up tomorrow and eat and is equal, okay, I'm just better at this than you are. And that's just how it is. Because generationally, I've been trained how to be better at this. All right. Moving on. Let's see, what was the next one? Um, so Rosa Parks and the Montgomery bus boycott was in December mm -hmm. 1955. Um, mm -hmm. The Central High School was integrated in September 1957, and um, and Luda, they were called the Luda Rock Nine. Um, this this was a study group that they were in. Um, so this group right here, it was a high school that they refused to let them in, and this was the first time that um, they called a thing they called the, the National Guard it got sent to the to this to this area, the Luda Rock to uh protect the the um the little rock nine to so make them integrate on campus into into high school and it was the first time that ever happened mm -hmm. so that was that's that's what we just looked at the um central nine um, is that that picture that we normally see of that little black girl on the stairs with the book yes in her hand? that was a cover of uh that was on the cover of lifetime she's still alive right yes yes mm -hmm. All right. Um, Could you imagine? Just think about that, though. Just think about that. You and and that as a little girl having to be escorted into a school, and that being part of history, have happening so long ago. Well, not even that long ago, but just yeah, really still not, alive. But just imagine if shit. Imagine if Malcolm X was still alive. Martin Luther King was still alive. Imagine if shit, Harriet Tubman was still alive. Could you imagine that? 
what they would what what they would think of how this yeah. world progressed after their thing that they did in history. Like she was a little girl just going to school. She didn't realize. She may or may not have realized. I'm sure that day she did. I, but I so think many years has passed. Like I know she's done interviews, and I would like to go back and, and watch them just to see her mentality. Is if you did that as a little girl and looking at the way the world is now, what do you think? Did was it worth it, or did we miss the mark? Like what 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 should we do better? Ruby Bridges, uh, Sam said her name is Ruby Bridges. She's done interviews, but uh -huh. I, I to, to remark on what you said as far as ha had MLK lived and and had Brother Malcolm lived and, and things like that. I I don't think I don't think that the big three uh, had MLK, Malcolm X, and the Black Panthers survived the Civil Rights Movement. I don't think the last 50 years would have played out the way that it would have, that it has. True. Uh, I, True. I, I think, I, I think the concepts behind the black Panthers, the original beliefs and concepts behind yes. the initiation of the bloods and the Crips, um, the original, the original movement of Martin Luther King. I don't think had those three not been stalled out by their deaths, I, I don't think, I, I don't think the last fifty years of American history would have been, yeah, would have played out the same it would, at all. It would be, di it would be different. It would be a different type of dominoes to fall. Yes, if they, if they yeah, I, do, so, yeah. I definitely believe that. Also, that, that things would have went very different. That makes sense. All right, let's oh, maybe the same. Maybe the same. You never know. Maybe, maybe yeah. they would we never know. I just a lot of. To me, a lot of things it happened because of of those of those tragedies. Yeah, I, I think with the political strength that MLK had, political strength that he had, he would have been one of the first black senators or representatives in, in the yeah. South. And had that happened, that would have been. That would have just like like Mer said, that would have been a domino effect. And, yeah. and I think, yeah, I think it would have been completely different yeah. over the last the 50 years. Been different. All right. So let's keep going. Um the death of Emmett Till, August of 1955. And you know, this, this, is, this, this is this is still talked about and still heavy. That's because she's still alive. Till today, and they huh? just did they just did a movie about this, or a, this is recent, like I want to say a week or two ago, or maybe within the last month. It's on Hulu, I want to say. That's not or what Netflix. pisses me off. What pisses me off, she's still alive and yet to be punished for it. Right. And has this, admitted doing it. Right. This was one of the first stories when I remember going to school and starting to learn about this history. This was one of the stories that really angered me as a kid. As a teenager, this is one of those stories that it just if a little bit of common sense was used, it could have easily been seen like he shouldn't be he shouldn't be dead. But the balls of his mother at that point, his mother was like, oh, what you're not going to do is play my son. You're talking about the movie Let the World See? I, I want to say I, I I have not watched it and I don't plan to watch it. I can't visually. Yeah, she's not gonna watch something like that. I I, rem I remember watching movies. watching and hearing <clears throat> something about the story. The words, the actual quote, "Let the world see," is what his mother said yeah. when they said that because of the way he looked, yeah, that they should do a closed casket. And her response was, "No, let the yeah, world see what good. they did to my baby." Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And she had an open casket after he had been lynched and invited media. Uh, there's actually a Lifetime uh, Life magazine took a photo and published it of his of his open casket with. And I believe she's in frame. Yeah, it's called the women of women of the movement. And it's um, I want to say it was on NBC. It, it premiered on ABC January 6th. So last month. And now it is on. You can watch it again on Hulu. Um, well, who, Hulu's got the series Let the World See. Uh, Nia Long is playing. 
Okay. Because I'm sure they've done, they've plays, done this. Plays they've done Miami this a few times. Mobley. Mobley. Okay. Yeah, I can't. Mm-mm. Also, I don't know if y'all, I don't know if y'all watched a Lovecraft Country, the Lovecraft Country series. Nope. But there was um, th- there's a episode that that reference to him as well <clears throat> in that. Um, if you if you if you watch it and you know the even if you're familiar with the story, if you pay attention to that episode, you'll know that's what they're referring to. Yeah. It was a, it was a kid that went away on a vacation. They had all that set up in one of the episodes of Lovecraft. All right, let's keep going. Um, Loving birth Virginia ruling in 1958. So this was the first court battle to uh, get approved for interracial marriages. Right here. 1960. Yep. yep. It now, is 2022. Now, that, <laughs> that was, was 1960. The laws that she fought in that case, we're still on the books till 83. Yeah. Hmm. Hi, there. My name, hi, my name's Trey. My birth was evidence of a crime in progress. Mm. Born in Petersburg, Virginia. Yeah. You was born in Virginia, Trey? Yeah, Petersburg. That was, that's what, I think that's where um, they was. That's where the battle was. I think, yes, in Virginia, because they got knock on their door. The police went knock on their door while she was laying down on her husband's lap. Yep, and it was like we need to know the nature of your relationship because if y'all together, y'all are breaking the law. What the day I was born, this month in 1980, February 8th, at the time of my birth, had they want had. Anybody wanted to push the issue, my mother could have been put into a girl's home. My father could have been put in prison, and I could have ended up in the foster care system in 1980. That's crazy. 20 years after that case, I could have ended up in what at the time was their CPS, the foster care system, because the laws didn't come off the books until 1983. All right, that's just Let's crazy. Keep going. Um, all right, core and freedom rise May 1961. Um, this also go with um the sit in movement and founding of SNCC, which stands for uh, shit student students. I'm gonna tell you right now. Um, but this started. Real big in, uh, in North Carolina. Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. Yeah. So this right here was um, Breathe, Birth the Core and Freedom Rise, where those two organizations would go have a sit-ins at different restaurants. And Freedom Rise would have sit-ins on buses and trains. So they worked together um basically both of them had the same goal or same execution style um of how to not violently get known um but sncc really really started blowing up really big and it spread all the way up to, up the coast with sit-ins where and even black and whites started doing sit-ins go ahead trey you about to say something and their initial meetings happened at the ag gaston motel in birmingham alabama And, yeah, and, my, the only, um, and the only reason I know that is because, like I said, family history, being okay. going going from fam, going from family member to family member. Okay. Um, and, and just age- recently, my um, our brother Dean told me that my dad was part of that. I didn't know that. Yes, and see y'all the core. Which one? The sit the sit in movement. Okay. My dad, my dad. Nice. From from my understanding, um, our brother Dean told me that. <clears throat> that's how he got kicked out of college because he was part of that movement. Oh, I didn't know that until a few years ago. I was at Bernadine house and we was talking about my dad and she had said something and I was like, are you serious? She's like, yeah, your dad was part of that. And that's how he got kicked out of college. I was like, are you, I never knew that. And now it makes right. sense. Now when I think about my dad and, and how he felt about some of these race of relation issues, I, I, 
I could see my dad doing that. Yeah. <laughs> Definitely see uh, him doing it. Core and SNCC um, actually organized a lot of the beginning, a lot of the beginning and all the way up to the height of the Birmingham campaign. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. what, what became known as the Birmingham campaign. Yeah. Uh, everybody's seen these photos, uh, black protesters being, having water hoses turned on them, having dogs turned on them, the, the mm -hmm. sit-in photos where they were pouring That's coffee awesome. over the top of their head. And, and that has been recreated many times in, yep. in different movies. But uh, that that is one of the things that I learned about growing up, not only not only seeking out that information once I saw once I saw my name in a history book and, and realized that that in fact was my family that was doing that, it, it became it, it it became a point of pride for me. So I, I did what I could as far as researching and, and researching through the family. Okay. So, so um integration of old miss happened in September 1962. All right, which is Mrs. Um, Mississippi U. But yeah. what they call it Ole Miss. Um, in 1963, Birmingham Church bombed. Yep. First Baptist. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. um, also in 1963, I have a dream speech by Martin Luther King. Yep. Um, in 1960. That's another big one. Yeah. Um, um, there's a lot I of controversy did, about that about his speech too. Did y'all did y'all see that picture where Mahalia Jackson is turned <laughs> around looking at him and he had he was trying to read off and Mahalia this, rumor has it that Mahalia, Mahalia Jackson told him speak from your heart and he stopped looking at the paper and started speaking and that's how I have a did, did y'all have y'all heard that? Mm -hmm the the original the original speech uh the the original rough draft of the speech was uh lost to history um okay it, it, it was lost the original copy of the rough draft was lost to history okay uh, a lot of it a lot of what people say is the current speech that he went off at the podium is has freestyle? been found out to have been transcribed from from audio okay. so what the actual speech was supposed to say isn't we, necessarily we it, it it it's been lost to history okay the, but for the last i think it's the last two paragraphs of the speech itself have been confirmed as being that that him speaking from his heart not necessarily okay. him speaking from flashcards or from uh the rough draft that he had all right mm. all right so we got um civil rights act of 1964 mm -hmm. july 1964. we got the freedom summer and the mississippi burning murders yeah in june 1964. all right so I, I think when y'all mentioned earlier so this was mississippi burning yeah all right that's that movie yeah um what uh forgot his name that that wouldn't have been possible and and, and something that i i try to try to explain to a lot of people that i speak with online the civil rights act of 1964 would not have happened had it not been for jfk period um and, and it's one thing right. that i speak out about and speak out for he got assassinated in 63 or 64? JFK. Kennedy was 63. He got okay. He got okay. He got it was, it was submitted. It was in it was in the house. It was in Congress in 63. He was assassinated, and Bobby Kennedy pushed it forward. Bobby Kennedy, JFK got it to Congress. Bobby got it through Congress. Gotcha. Okay. November twenty second, nineteen sixty three, at twelve thirty in Dallas, okay. Texas. Yeah. Okay. All right. But uh, yeah, JF, JFK got it to Congress, and Bobby Kennedy is the one. Robert Kennedy, 
the is the one through. that pushed it through Congress. Had it not been for the Kennedys, I'm not sure the legislation would have gone anywhere. I, I think it would have died on the on the Senate floor. No, mm. I, no, I, I agree with you. And that's that's one main reason why he got assassinated. Both of them. Yeah. Um. So all that led to this right here, Selma to Montgomery March in March 1965. There's a movie about this also. It's called Selma. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, good movie. Yeah, I was about to say it was actually yeah, a good movie. Good. It was actually a good movie. Um, that's one of the movies that even if you can't take certain um, black history stuff, the violence and stuff, I think that's one movie you probably can you probably can watch. I, I think I yeah. I, I think the a, a lot of Selma Montgomery to Selma that got put into uh, another movie, Get on the Bus. The the influence that that movie took from the Selma to Montgomery movement was amazing as well. So it, I, I would definitely hit both of those up. I didn't see Get on the Bus, but I saw Selma. Get on the bus with Get on the Bus had a more modern, more of a modern viewpoint looking at the actions and, and looking at the histor history of Selma. Uh -huh. um, Selma covered it from a, from a first person perspective, where Get on the Bus actually, in the storytelling of its story, had a lot of flashbacks to the the ideals. And the strength of self. All right. Um, Malcolm X shot to death February 1965. Ooh. Assassinated. Um, back to back, three years in a row. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're right. Uh, Voting Rights Act of 1965, August 1965. Um, the rise of Black Power. Yep, Black Panthers, Huey. Black Power. Um, that's the original seeds for the Bloods and the Crips, too. Yeah. Uh, uh, Fair Housing Act, April 1968. Hmm. That ain't even. That's still not happening. <laughs> yep, right. Is Slum Lords? Um, I, I, that's I, still I, not happening. Martin I, Luther I, King. I, oh, go ahead. I think so yesterday, the, the Fair friends. Housing Act, the Fair Housing Act, had it been left alone, I think would have worked. Um, I, I think the ideals, the ideals in the redirection of it towards projects in uh, late 70s and early 80s Reaganomics is what derailed the Fair, Fair Housing Act. OK. All right. So next one on is Martin Luther King assassinated April 4th, 1968. Mm. Um, we got a uh, Charlie Shirley Chisholm runs for president in 1972. Mm. She, I, I think that if you go back and you read some of the accounts of that, uh -huh. um, Shirley Chisholm. Ms. Chisholm was actually told that there's a possibility and yes, there was a slim chance that she could have in fact been president, mm -hmm. yeah. but there were a lot of people in the background and, and there's that. a lot of autobiographies that speak to this, that were, they understood what her percentage chance was and they did everything they could to, to parade her around like a show pony instead. Um, yeah, they that, they that was more for media than anything else. Yeah, gotcha. Mm -hmm. All right, Carrot. Let's see. Um, the Bach decision in front of action in 1978. Here's another government program that got destroyed by politics. Yeah. Um, Jesse Jackson galvanizes black voters in 1984. I don't remember. Huh? I'm trying yeah, to remember what all happened. Because oh, okay. Um, 
Oprah Winfrey launched his syndicated talk show in 1986. Mm. And Harpo Organ and Harpo Incorporated right. never looked back. <laughs> nope. Uh Los Angeles riots in 1992. Ooh. I mm. see. Yeah. Mm. Get up and get 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 down. Nine one one is joking your time. Joke in your time. Uh, <laughs> I was twelve when that happened, and I I distinctly because it was the only thing that was on TV for like three four weeks. Uh -huh. I remember that, and I remember that that was the first time in my life at twelve years old that I actually felt outrage uh -huh. because nobody could explain to me how it was okay that those four men were beating him with nightsticks and and it, it that was that was justice okay. that was law that was okay that that according to the courts it was okay that that happened and that was the first time that i ever heard a sentence that i have heard far too much in my life and that was the first time that I ever remember hearing he should have just not he, if he if only just he listen. hadn't resisted. Yeah, I, yeah, it, it's crazy because I I was I was twelve as well. I remember being in middle school, and after that happened, I'm in Georgetown, which is clear across another the other side of the country, right? That's the yeah, East Coast. I'm on East Coast. That's all the West Coast, and that I think it was I think I was a Friday. Like after the verdict and shit came out, it was a it was it was a riot in Georgetown yep. where people left school, and it was blacks versus whites. Well, blacks going against whites, like it was a riot, and they really was. Yeah, it's crazy. That, I remember that, them shutting down travel to Fort Bragg because I was in Fayetteville, North Carolina. Hmm. I remember that. All right, all right. Let's see. Nineteen ninety five was the Million Man March. I went to yeah. that. This is what get on the bus was about. Yeah. I remember I remember going to this and um I wasn't fully aware of my of my blackness at that point I was like 14 15. I had just started high school. Um I can't even tell you. Well no. I don't even remember how I ended up there, but I remember when I when I went, I was I did not feel like this is gonna sound bad, but I don't care. I did not feel like there was a real message given. It just felt like somebody up there talking to a bunch of people, and it it looked good. It was all the pomp and circumstance. It was, yeah, black fist in the air. Everybody was dressing all black. You were saying hi to black people you didn't know. Like, hey, how you doing? Good afternoon, brother. How you doing? Good afternoon, sister. And then after that, everybody went back home. It started the next day like it was a regular day. I don't remember going there and saying, feeling like black people or black men in particular were empowered, that they were going to go home and start change. None of that. I was like, okay, it was a nice day out with a bunch of black people like a big ass barbecue with no food so i think um like i didn't i didn't go so i didn't didn't um hear the message so i can't speak on that but i think one of the most impactful things because you no know, at this time by by 1995 it wasn't like 1965 between those times there was a lot of the so-called black on black crimes and gangs and stuff like that where we got to a point where we, we we wasn't getting along we started killing each other along with the system killing us other races killing us so yep. the thing that i saw to me at that age the most impactful thing was the fact that i don't know if they reach a million but the fact that we were able to get so many of us on one accord to that area and be on the same page no violence and everybody was there for a positive cause that hasn't yeah. happened since the civil rights era to me was something that i looked at at that age and at that point because i didn't hear the speech or whatnot what i thought was impactful i remember asking you, my father why we weren't going was impactful. huh what did you oh, feel you was impactful? 
No, no, no. You you said you 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 thought the message was impactful. What did you get from it? I I just said it. You said it wasn't or it was? It was. I, to okay. me, that's what I thought was impactful. Oh, just the fact that there was no violence. No, no like you had nothing I said just now? I did, but maybe I missed it. <laughs> he, he said that the impact for him was the fact that it was the first time that that many black people had been together yeah. and not been in a negative light since the civil rights since, movement. The, since the civil rights movement and, and that I, was the actual impact of the of yeah. significant I didn't, I didn't hear like i said i didn't hear the speech so i can't speak on that but oh, for you me, did not 15, hear the speech okay. i did not hear the speech so i can't speak on that for me but me at that time i was 15 years old when georgetown south carolina so to see that many black people because during that time was black on black crimes Blacks were killing each other. Like it was hard enough for us to go to a barbecue without fighting or yeah. you know what I'm saying? Doing yes. throughout America. So at that point, that was the first time that many people came together and went to see to, that much unity. Yes, since the civil rights era. So to me at 15, that's what I saw as impactful. Got it. I can't speak on the speech because I didn't hear it. That's what I said. Gotcha. That happened just before I moved out west, and I remember asking my dad, "Why didn't we go?" Because I I was in Fayetteville. That was our second time in Fayetteville. Um, but my dad, my dad, I didn't understand. I didn't understand his his reason at the time. I, I later found out, um, but his response was, "We can't go because I'm not allowed to be there." And I didn't understand that my my dad was active duty, so it, it was one of those okay. things where it it, gotcha. it was when stupid rules in, in the military law book could mm -hmm. easily get enforced if you made the military look bad. Um, mm -hmm. One of those gotcha. being if you're out protesting or or speaking out against the government, that could be considered sedition. And would have ended in, in 1995 most definitely would have ended my father's career okay all mm -hmm. right so we so go I, to i later found out and understood probably about eight nine years later i understood that okay so we go to the next timeline um colin powell becomes secretary of state 2001. i remember that one of the two um, major heads of uh desert shield desert storm Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I don't. I, I later how they crucified him for uh, the war on terror, uh, I thought was more impactful and, and more eye opening. But I, I do remember Colin Powell because, yeah. <laughs> All right, so we had um, Barack Obama becomes the 44th U.S. president in 2008. That was a fun time. Uh, then we yeah, had... I'm glad you had fun. <laughs> I say fun because it was bitter. It was it was it was a I don't want to say a gift of the curse, um, but it was it gave a lot of children hope. Right. It gave a lot of our kids the ability to say, you know, I most kids, you know, are usually aspire to be doctor, lawyer. Some sometimes even kids wanted to be cops back in the day when the cops didn't, you know, wasn't the enemy of the of the neighborhoods. Um, but when Obama became president, it was like, wow, we really got a black president. And a lot of kids was like, yes, I, I want to be the next president. I can do that. I can do anything. I know I can be what I want to be if I work hard at it, right? So you start to have all of these ambitions. Like, okay, if, if, if we can get to that goal, then what other goals can we get to? But it was yeah. very, it was the it was the total opposite as well. People was like hated him and didn't want him there. They fought very hard for him not yeah. to be there. And then when he got in office, they fought against everything he wanted. Black people thought he was going to save the world. And then a couple afterwards, black people was like, oh, you ain't do shit for us. It was a time to be alive. <laughs> it was a time to be alive. My memories with uh, President Obama started in 2007 during the campaign. Um, 
for lack of a better way to put it, I remember spending a lot of time in 2007, uh, what I like to call trimming the fat off my friends list. Um, oh, right. <laughs> yeah. Cause, I got you. Um, I got you. One, one, of my, one of my all time favorite quotes from Maya Angelou when someone shows you who they are, believe them. Right. And that's exactly what folks did in 2007. I'm like, mm, right. wow, that that's your opinion. You, you feel that he just is not going to be a good president, not because, I mean, and there was a laundry list of, of media talking points that got put out as yeah. to why he was not going to be a good president. But you you just going to go straight to he is a black man in America is not going to be a strong leader. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I think we should stop talking. Click, click, click. Bye. Bye. I lost friends. I lost family. Um, and mm. in 2008, when he got elected, I I sat there with the biggest, ugliest smile on my face. <laughs> when my first song yeah. did everything but cry in the middle of Iraq because Obama was elected president. Yeah. And, did, yeah. and as an E4 in the military, in a combat zone, dared my first song to say something. Dared him to. That's when you seen the hate really show. That's when I yeah. think the hate. I think that's when people started to really vocalize of the hate that they had. We always knew it was there, and we always oh, saw right. when he was running. But Absolutely. I think once he got elected, is when they they really really came out with the yeah. hate, and then with yeah. Trump, they just they it was just got all overboard. Yeah, but, oh, yeah. yeah. That was, November tenth. No, yeah. November 10th, 2008. Oh, yes. Everybody. Yeah. Everybody. That's when everybody, everybody started show. showing out. I'm like, mm. well, mm. right. Well, this is how you felt all this time. Okay. Yeah, but I'm your friend. Okay. Yeah. Listen. Yeah. I, um, I also messed up because I read, I actually read the book, Dear White People, that year. So I, ooh, I had a lot of people mad at me. <laughs> <laughs> A lot of people mad at me. I, yeah, we've I, had presidents that have caused a lot of drama before them, the Bushes and all the Clintons, right? But Obama, forget yeah. about it. Yeah, mm -hmm. it was crazy. All right, so the next timeline is um the Black Lives Matter movement. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm then, still dealing with arguments. Yeah, you got this. <laughs> I'm you still this dealing with arguments about this. <laughs> Yeah, um, I'm stuck. That, look, I'm stuck in country Missouri. Yeah, but before Ooh. before you speak, because this this next one falls right into it. Right after that, we had the George Floyd protest. Here we go. This is where it starts. This is where it goes downhill from here. Okay, <laughs> to 2022. It's, it's where All it's right. Here. Look, I'm gonna say this. And, 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 and I'm going to say this because I know this is a safe place to say this. Yes. If your ignorance extends to the point where a man can be videotaped and have someone else kneeling on his neck for nine minutes, nine if minutes. your ignorance causes you to form your mouth when he has four human beings, a combined weight of almost a half ton sitting on his body and immobilizing him and the first words out your mouth are he should have he shouldn't have resist how the fuck is he going to resist that's one two i'm stuck in missouri country ass missouri i have mm -hmm. said this multiple times and i'm gonna say it again and i'm gonna say it until the day i leave this damn state if world war if the civil war part 2 pops off tomorrow i already know i am behind enemy lines <laughs> if that bitch pops off, I need, I need, I'm gonna need the new Underground Railroad to get the hell out of here. These are arguments that I have been having almost on a weekly basis. Every time Damn. another name is etched into that wall, every time it's should have resisted. Well, he was a criminal. Well, he had this, this, and this from the from five years. The cops didn't know any of that shit walking through that door. 
Right. They they did they weren't on the warrant. They weren't on the paperwork. As far as the cops knew, they weren't there. So there's no reason. There's no reason that they should have fired. And every argument that I have had simply put, did, you know what? If he was a criminal, if he had a warrant, if he for any reason, then his ass should have been arrested, put in jail, and a given trial. a trial. They had no business being judged jury and execution. That part. And every time, every time someone around me speaks up, that 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 they're constantly in my in my halo because they're not in my friends, then damn sure not in my family. Every time somebody in my halo speaks up and I just look at them and go, wow. So you're not gonna say a damn thing when it's me on the TV, huh? You're not gonna say a damn thing when it's me airbrushed on 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 a on a t-shirt. Somebody turns me into a pair of J's. You, you it, it's it's gonna be he shouldn't have resisted, right? And All the like, shit about Trey, lock that's going on right now. Damn Trey, what you do, Trey? Oh man, you should, you should just make it home. Just make it home I'm Trey. still trying to figure out where where the NRA is on a mere lock present day. Somebody <laughs> explain this to me. Just make it home, Trey. Law, law abiding, legal gun owner, hmm. no knock warrant. People hmm. busting into his house in the middle of the night. He goes for his gun, gets shot by cops. It already is less than silent. Less than silent. Not only are they silent, their only response is no response. And that is a response. No comment has always been a response. Yep. You take the Fifth Amendment in court, that's still a response. <laughs> Plead the fifth. <laughs> One, two, three, four. Fifth. I'm tired. I'm tired of the fact that I actually support movements and, and support people that are going out there and, and fighting the good fight to stop people like me from ending up on a t-shirt, from having from having programs put out, from from having GoFundMe's to to help bury and send them home. But the second I open my mouth, where I'm at right now, oh, there that's a terrorist organization. Why why haven't they been labeled terrorists? But what shuts them up real quick it is as soon as they say some dumb shit like that, I'm like, gee, uh, uh, until uh, until the Ku Klux Klan gets acknowledged by the United States government. As a race hate group, as a terrorist organization, when they have bombed buses, they have bombed buildings, they have killed mm -hmm. hundreds of thousands of people over the last 60 years, and people still are in Washington, D.C., arguing they're not a terrorist organization. Don't talk to me about BLM. Right. Don't talk to me. Right. Don't, don't you you have no leg to stand on. None. None. Right. And 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 Ooh. All right, so we go, we go, we go, we go, we go, we go move on. We go, we go move on. We, that's why I, I let that. that's why I let Trey right, got hey, we, exactly empty the clip out. <laughs> Trey, go empty the clip. Hey, so we, <laughs> you gotta get you gotta get that black. You gotta get that. <laughs> yeah, I had to get a refill. <laughs> Uh, no, but I feel so, him though. I feel no, him. no, no, for real. But uh, so let, let's move on. Our last, our last timeline. Uh, Kamala Harris becomes the first woman, first black woman U.S. Vice President in 2021, which was just last year. Um. When I put this, and I got the, the rest of the stuff is more, the rest of the stuff we talk about is, is just black excellence. Um, except for one thing, but still part of black excellence. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to do the last Wednesday um, for Black History Month about black history, black excellence. And I was trying to figure out, you know, what's the best way to do it. And then I saw this timeline and I knew it probably would bring up some ill feelings but <laughs> but on some real shit you look back from 1619 to the last four timeline events that we talked about 
-hmm. what you should get from this the bittersweetness or the final thing is how we have fucking really overcame overcome so much adversity so much obstacles so much shit that's been thrown in our way to try to make us say fuck it try to make us say to try to make us give up to try to discourage us and where you have even though it's for show you had a woman run for president you had um you had jesse jackson run for president then we finally get a black president then we got a black vice president um female at that female at that and like we and it's 400 that's a lot to accomplish in 400 400 years because probably what we'll say what 300 of those years was <laughs> 200 years of slavery the other 100 years was you know you could still be killed even though you we, even though we wasn't on you could still be killed with talking other, about the jim crow country. era you talking about the, the, the segregation fight hanging yep. so like you know like obama had pros and cons kamala has got pros and cons over jesse jackson about pros and cons but the shit that we've overcome and we still i'm not and we haven't made it all the way over the promised land yet i'm just saying we as a people have really overcame a fucking lot we not where we want to be but we're not where we were exactly. right exactly right. just that's why i want to go through that timeline we could just go boom 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 to see where we started and yeah. where we currently are the progress and where we can still evolve to become for our kids grandkids great grandkids in the future yeah because our kids are definitely living in a very different world than what we grew up in yes very different you know very different they don't have stories yeah. their the history that they're learning is is further back history than than what we learned because as you can see some of the progression for us only happened 60 80 years ago right we have, if we have grandparents they actually lived during the time of those changes yeah. our children that's real history to them it's going to be a hundred plus years before them we mm -hmm. still have parents who are who can who can um who can give us those stories of when I have aunts and uncles that can give those stories of when um you the could brown look the the brown I, I boy, could, especially my dad in Georgetown my dad yeah. in Georgetown could give all those stories yeah. about how yeah. it was in the neighborhood in Georgetown my, being very segregated when he grew up my yeah, family's all from Birmingham Ooh. so I definitely got them stories yeah my dad was born in 1937. He's still alive. He's 84 years old. So, ooh, he got. Stories. I know he got stories. Ooh. Yeah, I know ooh, he got yeah. stories. He probably got some some Marv, stuff. I'm that telling you, that, tell you that oral history I was talking about. Make sure yeah. you get that. I was make just sure saying to a down. couple of friend of mine that I wish I had grandparents. Like my my only grandparent that I've ever known, my mom's mom. She died when I was 10. So I don't really know how it is to have grandparents. And I really wish that I had someone in my family that was 70, 80, 90 years old to really sit down and get that good old wisdom from where they could tell you the stories of how it was when they could not step out of their house because of certain fears to how it, it progressed to now they could come out of the house and they can actually live somewhat of a decent life, a life that they probably would have never thought would have been possible when they was getting dogs sicked on them and being ran down with hoses and being hung from trees and things like that. Like slavery wasn't that far in their past. And there's some of them are still alive to, to, to tell that story. Like I, that's the, that's the only thing I really wish I had was grandparents be like, what was it like when you was finally able to not have to go to the colored only bathroom? That may be like a little thing for some of us, right? But mm -hmm. could you imagine? Could you imagine right now, Trey, if you went and somebody put a paper bag to you and said yes or no about doing something? How that would feel, and that was your daily life, to having to go through that and to now not having to go through it at all, and you're just like, I don't even know what to do with myself. I'm, I, I find myself fortunate. I, I this is Three a really weird feeling. I have never felt more fortunate 
for having my grandfather, for having my aunt Dell, my aunt Honey, and my aunt May, because they all grew up in Birmingham, about four miles from downtown. They mm. they grew up, they lived there, and they fought to live there, and and they they died living in living not more than ten miles from the hospital from where they were born mm -hmm. and there were a lot of times when when i was young that i rolled my eyes and i said oh here's another here's another story here's another story here's another story my my grandmother my dad's mom emmazine took me to meet this man when she came to visit us in in birmingham that I'd never heard about and and just just a, a an old black man sitting sitting in a wheelchair and he he sat there and and told a story and four or five years later it's February and we're doing Black History Month in California and they're talking about AG Gaston and I'm like yeah, he was a nice guy. He's like, what, 108, 109? And everybody looks at me and they're like, what do you mean he's a nice guy? Yeah, he's, he's an old guy. He's, he's in a wheelchair right now. And to see the significance in other people's faces, when they look at you and go, wait a minute, you've met A.G. Gaston? Yeah, I, I met him before we moved out from the East Coast. And, and I've I've never felt so fortunate because once again I, I truly believe that the oral history from generation to generation has always been the very root of what Black history is because the true story gets told that way. It, it's it's not filtered through the media. It's not filtered through an editor. It's it's not filtered so it's palatable for mass consumption. It's it's the actual genuine truth. And it's it's an amazing feeling to have those stories. And I look forward to passing them on to my son as I have been. Gotcha. All right. So the rest of the show, um, we talk about, we're going to leave on a good note, talk about black excellence or, and um, kind of like fun facts or what you call it. All right. So um, this is more, this is more like informational what of me telling all right so let's see first one so madam cj walker uh was born in 1867 died in 1919. she was the first african-american woman to become a self-made millionaire after creating a line of hair products geared toward black hair um she actually there's actually a movie about her i forgot the name of it y'all remember the name of it mm -hmm. there, there's a movie about her I know back about the um, Google it. Let us know. I'll go to the I'm, next. I'm doing the same. <laughs> Madam, um, Madam CJ Walker. Beck, we can't hear you. Oh, sorry. It was on Netflix called Self Made. Yep. That's yep. it. Ooh. That's it. And it was good. Mm. It was good. You can say whatever you want. My girl's in it. I live. I'm gonna have to go back and watch that. <laughs> it was good, but it did reveal something that I wasn't I wasn't aware of, and I'm sure many other people wasn't either. Don't tell it. I won't. Okay. All right, next I, I, one, didn't, um, I didn't know Octavia was in it. I'm gonna have to go yeah. back and watch that. All right. Yeah. She does really good in it too. I I love her to death anyway. Next thing is uh next person is Garrett Morgan. Born 1877, died in 1963. Uh, the three light traffic signal was invented by Gary Morgan in 1923 with only an elementary school education. He was a black inventor and son of an enslaved parent. Yes. Oh, wow. Was originally designed to speed up logistics and to stop accidents in the workplace when moving materials from one side of the factory to the other. Was built on larger scale for traffic purposes. I remember that one. All right. Um, all right. So Charlotte Fortin 
Grimke, born in 1837, died in 1914. Uh, she was an African-American educator, poet, anti-slavery activist. She taught freed black slaves during the Civil War and later. Uh, she was also the first black teacher to teach at uh, a Penn School in South Carolina. First mm. black teacher to teach at the Penn School in South Carolina. All right. We got Booker T. Washington. Booker T. Uh, was born in slavery, but rose to be an advisor to many United States presidents and also became the director of the Te of Tuskegee Institute. That's dope. Um, some black owned products that you need in 2021 and beyond. Um, I don't know what these are. Some of them I don't uh, 3L Fitness. Oh, uh, uh, that's one. Another product is Art Pays Me. Another product is Glow by Day. Another product is Kid Rock. Another product is King Edward Grooming. Another, day product, is a hair product. Uh, another product is Convikins, and another product is Sarishi. I'm familiar with 3L Fitness. Okay. And 3L product. Fitness is uh, it's it's a more holistic approach instead okay. of having uh, yeah. going going specifically with um, organic made, organic grown uh, products as far as your diet's concerned. It, okay. it's it's a bit of a twist on the keto on the keto diet okay but instead of some of the things that you're restricted to in the keto diet it's it points you directly towards uh the organic and all of their all of the powders and mixes that you get from dietary supplements and stuff they're they're all organic they're none of them are chemical chemical based or like like the energy powders that they put in them, uh, energy drinks and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, Real Fitness does that all with herbs and spices. Okay. Art Pays Me is actually a podcast. It says it helps artists use their power to improve their lives and the world by exploring the business strategies of successful creatives. So it's probably, it looks like it's a business. Oh. Okay. It's based in Canada, Nova Scotia, Dwayne Jones, it looks oh, like. Oh, nice. Mm -hmm. Anything else you wanted to Google real quick on um, back? King Edward grooming. I don't know what that is. I assume that I would assume that deal with hair. Isn't King Edward grooming the uh the, the men's line? The men's hair, the the men's hair and facial hair line. Um, Ooh, oh, they got facial. Oh, they do facial hair as well. Um, it's for beards. It's a beard. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay. Tight beard help, help, get, help get that line tight. That I, I was about to say. Cold. That sounded Carter. familiar. <laughs> and Vulcans. Convicans is, is napkins. Oh, is black on napkins? Black on product napkins? I'm, oh. I'm just looking up Convicans. First thing that came up was it looks like um, napkins, but this advertisement don't don't look right. Mm, I don't know. Kimmy Couture. Kimmy Couture started out as a, a influencer. I can tell by just the name. Yeah. <laughs> Glow by this. She, hair she started product. out as a that that's her brand after the, after she rebranded after being an online influencer. <coughs> Glow by this is, is hair products. Different yeah, she like, used um, to do yes, uh, 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 what did product. she call? Kimmy Couture. 15 second is, grooming tip. She started on Vine. Yeah, it's there it says beauty products. Yeah. And sure, Shay, I don't know what that is. Sure, Shay. Look like Kid Rock is shades for kids. Sure, Shay and Co. Shades and t shirts for kids. That's what that look like. 
uh, named after my two kids, was founded in 2012. Natural and organic products. Yeah. Not bad. So, Not bad at all. Cool. And, so, and there's, more, there's more to the list. I just took like about seven or eight of them. Okay. Um, Robert Johnson was the first black billionaire, former majority owner of Charlotte Ball. Kathy became the first African American billionaire in 2001. Um, was a was a formerly a owner of BET, right? That's saying, right? He left uh, BET to buy um buy Charlotte Hornets, I believe. Really? Mm -hmm. I wish you would have stayed at BET. Yeah, because BET now much. <laughs> <Man. laughs> um, yeah, right, so seven this, ratchet. All right, so this right here is the five. So these are five owned companies, um, five black owned companies that uh, many people may not know. Well, I didn't know. Um, number one, and all of these companies make over five hundred million dollars a year. Each one of these make over five hundred million dollars a year. So, first so they're, one for, is, they're Fortune Five companies. Then. Yeah. So first one is Worldwide Technology, based in Maryland Heights, Missouri, a global IT company that serves technology needs of large public and private organizations. Founded by David L. Stewart, this company has long been the largest Black-owned business and has grown to twelve billion in annual revenue, with more than six thousand employees. Even more, they have approximately four million square feet of warehousing distribution and integration space in more than 20 facilities throughout the world. And yes, they are black owned. Dope. All right, no, number two, Act One Group, based in uh, Torrance, California. This company provides staffing, human resource, management solutions to Fortune 500 companies and industries from entertainment to technology and finance to biotech. Founded by Janice Bryant Howard, this company generates more than 2.2 billion a year not just black owned but this is woman owned black woman owned I hear that. the anderson dubos company based in lowestown ohio this company provides logistics solutions and unparalleled services to the world's most elite corporations in the quick service industry one <clears throat> about warney anderson they have more than 400 employees and generate more than 540 million in annual revenue black owned Global Alliance Automotive, based in Detroit, Michigan, this company is a global automotive parts supplier. As a worldwide group of independent rep representation companies, they are an adequate co contemporary answer to recent major structural changes, changes within the automotive industry. They pull in almost $520 million every year in revenue. Black-owned. Number five. They're also the number one employer in Detroit. Oh, nice. <laughs> That's nice. what's up. GAA, uh, uh, if you've seen Eight Mile, the factory that Eminem's working at is a GAA uh -huh. factory. Oh shit. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um I remember those scenes very well. Yeah. Uh, number five, Thompson <laughs> Hospitality. Based in Reston, Virginia. This company is the largest minority owned food service management company in the country. Founded by Warren Thompson, they were recognized in 2010 as Company of the Year by Black Enterprise Magazine. They have more than 4,000 employees, and their annual revenues are just shy of $500 million. Again, Black-owned. That's dope. There's they a lot of state black agencies. Owned. All right. Um, like, I couldn't do a show out um without talking about the divine nine of um, course so you got um got the kappas got the omegas aka's delta sigma gamma rose uh sigma zetas um divine iota iotas founded at morgan state university Part of the divine, so that's divine nine, and these are historically black Greek organizations that were uh, founded in the HBCUs, like we talked about earlier, with Wilberforce being um, the first known official HBCU. So I had to talk about that as well for our black excellence. Um, what is this right? 
All right, so we'll talk about going in. We'll talk about Black Wall Street. All right. Mm -hmm. Um, let me find. All right, so fortunately, I got it on my phone. Um, because that's gonna be that's right there is too small. And this is a. It's not too small. I can read it. Can you, you see that? Yeah, I, I got it on my phone. I mean, I got a squint where I got it on my phone. So I can read it <laughs> okay. on my phone. Huh? Okay. Okay. All right. Black Wall Street. The um the history of Black Wall Street. Um, Black Black Wall Street was a thriving community in the Greenwood in the early 1900s. This was a community that had bustling black owned businesses, theaters, schools, social health, and a strong distribution of wealth among its middle and upper classes. Reports estimate the community had more than 10,000 African American residents, and most of them were thriving. Black Wall Street was the epitome of a self sustaining community and strength. Black people supported each other, which allowed for easier access to resources, savings, housing, jobs, education, and health. Black Wall Street was just one of many thriving communities in the United States, but it also became a site that will serve as an example of the violence and the hatred that grew out of greed from white financial interests. All right. As Black Wall Street thrived and grew, so did greed and all your thirsty America in 1897. Just a few years before Black Wall Street was established, Oklahoma got its first oil well. While this discovery is praised for established economic wealth and stability in Oklahoma during the Great Depression, it attracted explorers of exploration companies in the 1920s. The oil discovery gave Black people the economic opportunity they needed. We weren't allowed to shop at white-owned stores and businesses. So the money we spent went right back into our own communities. All you gave rise to opportunities and economic freedoms for black people, despite Oklahoma's status as a segregated state. As you can imagine, envy and jealousy thrive. The thought of second class citizens receiving better economic opportunities than their white neighbors infuriated white Oklahoma residents. They retaliated against the black community, spreading hatred and accusing them of crimes. Many white people were full of loathing and wanted to bring black communities down. An accusation of sexual assault was the match that ignited the smoldering hatred and resentment of the thriving black Wall Street community. The accusation inspired a lynch mob, which included nearly 2,000 Ku Klux Klan members who wanted to get justice. Everything came crashing down on Black Wall Street on May 31st, 1921. In just 16 hours, police had arrested 60% of Black residents living in Black Wall Street. Malls burned down Black-owned businesses and homes and murdered hundreds of Black citizens. When Black men joined forces to protect their homes, they were ultimately driven out in fear for their lives. By today's estimates, the dreadful and murderous 16 hours caused more than $30 million in damages. The residents of Greenwood would blame for death and destruction, and the government made it nearly impossible to rebuild. But we can't rebuild a new Black Wall Street now by working together. Uh, the, the massacre at Black Wall Street was one of the largest massacres of Black citizens in America. It is important not to forget the pride and opportunity that Black Wall Street awarded African Americans. We worked hard, built a strong community, and supported each other, circulating black dollars within our community and doing business with one another is critical for our community's financial and economic strength. Um where'd you like find that article at, Mur? Um I can send it to you. I um I Google Black Wall Street. I I'm the the reason I ask is because it didn't mention at all the fact that the government bombed Black Wall Street. No, nah, it didn't it didn't go into detail about that. Okay. Um but that was I knew we was gonna talk more about it. Yeah. Yeah. 
because that was the last time that the United States government actually ever dropped bombs on U.S. citizens. Right. That's crazy. Yep. And that's how the $30 million in damages came from. Yep. The, uh, the Oklahoma was- City National Guard or the Oklahoma National Guard uh, purchased two 2,000-pound bombs and dropped them. Can you imagine being bombed just because you were making too much money? You know, no. <laughs> like, that, like that, that's the only reason. Yeah. That, that's the only reason. It wasn't bother nobody. Just <laughs> they started to come up with reasons to make it too much money. Oh, I'm I'm waiting. I'm I'm waiting. If they were to do that now, it would be listen. <laughs> and, and I'm glad you said that. Listen, because if we're gonna miss a lot of to that point, take that. it wouldn't be a bomb, it'd have to be a computer virus. The fact that I'm I'm waiting for somebody who is much smarter than I as far as the internet is concerned to realize that Black Wall Street can be recreated on the internet. And there's not a damn thing anybody can do about it using e-commerce, using uh, Bitcoin, using digital currency. And I really wish I, I I hope this finds its way on a black Twitter because I know there's somebody out there that is more intelligent as far as the Internet is concerned that will be able to do this. Right. Yeah, right. Wow. So, With the investing the thing- in black owned leadership, black owned businesses, black owned uh properties yeah black wall street can be rebuilt on the internet so yeah i know i said i wanted to um end on a on a positive note so um god don't worry i got it i got it though so um (laughs) what you laughing at you not being able to read that um so in near Atlanta, they got what they call a new Black Wall Street market established last year, 2021, in Stonecrest, Georgia. All right, the new Black Wall Street market is located in Stonecrest, Georgia, as a destination for family fun, entertainment, retail, gourmet grocery shopping, and fine dining. Set among a beautifully curated common space, there are over 100 plus shops and restaurants located inside this new and exciting development. As an extension of the Allen Entrepreneurial Institute, the new Black Wall Street market shares its mission to increase the size and number of minority and woman-owned businesses throughout the United States and globally. This new retail experience fosters operational excellence in these areas. So if you look up new Black Wall Street, Atlanta, this is what comes up. So Atlanta's attempting right now to recreate, it just started last year, to re- recreate a new Black Wall Street. You looking it up, Trey? I'm looking it up. I'm looking oh, it up, but I'm being selfish because I'm looking up Google Maps, too. <laughs> <laughs> I ain't but so far from that. What I'm hearing lately is that um, Atlanta is becoming blackity black. Like they're 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 rebuilding Atlanta. It used to always be black, but mm-hmm. like this new Black Wall Street and all of that, that they're really starting to rebuild Atlanta to kind of make it all things black for black music, black history, black fashion, black money. They're trying to all for some reason all of that is being is starting in Atlanta. There's a lot of a lot of businesses, a lot of people go to Atlanta because it's very black mm-hmm. versus LA, which is the opposite. <laughs> yeah and i mean only other place yeah sh- i mean in my opinion land is probably the ideal place to recreate black wall street where else do you think they would be able to do that at if it wasn't atlanta it, uh, um well, you from you from I'd up top. Birmingham. How, how black is how black is DC? Because you from up top, so you know better than me. No, DC is the hood hood. DC is 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 more drugs than DC than anything. <laughs> so no, so no to that. So no, not DC. Okay, so not other, DC, not New York. So other than I, I think other than Atlanta, wouldn't be a bad place, huh? 
I think Birmingham wouldn't be a bad place. Birmingham? Yeah. Really? Now one thing about Bur- now one thing about Birmingham. I don't like, know much about a, a block a block separates the has and have nots. True. But I got a question. E- e- even a block celebrating the have separating the has and has nots. I how about we do some gentrification in Birmingham for a different color? <laughs> Because they had gentrified the hell out of New York. Yeah. Brooklyn don't look like it used to. Like It's not the same Brooklyn I grew up in. Mm, Birmingham, Birmingham is interesting. But they have not gentrified Atlanta. <laughs> and, and, Atlanta, and never, just, Atlanta yeah. never got COVID. <laughs> like yeah. Atlanta is in a bubble at this point. <laughs> so I, I can see it. I, I can see Atlanta definitely being the number one spot. I, I would yeah. definitely put Birmingham as a secondary. Really? That's yeah, uh, I'm, I'm familiar with Birmingham because I got family from Tuskegee and also Mobile, so I'm, I'm familiar with Alabama city. So, Alabama, mm, Birmingham. Okay, you gonna make me look, being able make... to centralize, being able to centralize and strengthen the back the black dollar in Birmingham again. Uh, I, I just find me a politician in in Birmingham that's not gonna get behind that. Find me a politician that's not going to invest in that and, and try to make that happen and put that on their resume to try and get the black coat in Alabama. But wouldn't they get a lot of pushback? I, if it makes dollars, it makes sense, though. But still, the others do not want black people making no dollars or cents. It don't matter. A, true. But Birmingham has already done it once. We don't care. <laughs> we don't care what you want to see happen with our dollars and cents. <laughs> and, and I really think I, I think the mindset in Birmingham would definitely push it higher. Because I'm seeing a lot of things as I'm looking up Black Wall Street that 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 kind of sound like outside, just outside Atlanta type of things happening at New Black Wall Street. So uh, a, a lot of people trying to invest and dip their hands in it and yeah i i don't want to see that happen but it's atlanta yeah yeah i mean i'm sure they built it up i I just learned about it tonight when i was putting the show together um so i'm definitely uh what i lied my 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 cousin lives is from atlanta and she's like real pro-black uh like she really pays attention and and stuff like that um so she actually told me about it and i looked it up and got some more details but i'm definitely um next time in the area i'm going to check that check them out it 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 looks like a good facility um it it, i hope they expand um but the the new black wall street market at this point it's it's looking like the seed is has been planted there Mm -hmm. i i just want to be careful keep a careful eye on how it grows right and, and if it does please god don't let it but if it does fail I, I think alabama might be able to provide either mobile either birmingham montgomery definitely with how strong the black dollar is in montgomery i, I okay. could definitely see that being a little bit more so let, me, so, so let me ask you this because more because just as important as the as, as the black dollar um, the cities that you just mentioned, do you feel they have the the black mindset? Because like Becca said in Atlanta, the black mindset is uh, regardless, it is black dollars is feeding the black dollars. Like the the, 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 the black community, they feed into one another and, and it support each other to me more than any other city does as far as like black community supporting each other feeding each other, buying from each other, supporting yeah. them like they do in Atlanta. So yeah. do you think Birmingham and the city you mentioned will have the same mindset to be able to create a black Wall Street that had that, that mindset of, yo, we uniting to help each other, et cetera? With the fact that just, that just downtown Montgomery has 
close to 2% of all businesses in downtown are black owned with, with the fact that mm. both Birmingham, that Birmingham still sits, even with everything that's happened throughout the decades since the civil rights movement being centered in Birmingham, Birmingham still has one fourth of all businesses in Birmingham and the surrounding city structure, all all those all those little towns that grew into Birmingham as time, they're still sitting at about twenty three percent of overall businesses in the area, being black owned businesses, nice. strictly black owned businesses. Wow. Okay. And and most of those are legacy black owned Ooh. businesses, black businesses that have been passed from father to son to father to son. That's even more. Father, that's even, well, parent to child, parent to child. And that's big time because that means they're establishing that community. And that's not even taking black into people account. Know them. Yeah. That's not even taking into account the amount of the amount of side hustles, those garage door businesses that's that are run rampant throughout Birmingham. Okay. Like you you said you got family in Bur in Alabama, right? Yeah, Tuskegee. I ask him. Ask him how many how many people he knows running side hustles out of his, out of their garage in Tuskegee. <laughs> I bet you you'd be surprised. Probably a few. Because I and, and one of the things one of the things that I learned from family in Birmingham and and through, throughout the country because I come I come from a military family. Everybody's got a full time job, but everybody's got a full time hustle too. So that side really? hustle. If you can turn that side hustle into your full time job and stop having a boss and start making boss decisions, if you if you take that to a place like northern Alabama and give them that opportunity, hey, we we got a place. All you got to do is show up and build your business with with us in this location. I, I think. I think Alabama is a very fertile ground for for black business to to flourish. Okay, I don't because think that's on anybody's radar. It's and not. That's the best part. It's not. Yeah. It's gonna pop up out of nowhere. Nowhere. And if it because of the fact that it's not on anybody's radar, they can't stop it before they can't stomp it out before it grows. You could sneak in and make money and 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 nobody know yet. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And by the time people know that you'd be too you'd be too strong to do anything exactly. about it. Exactly. Yeah, you would have made enough money, but you'd be like, all right, well now yeah. you know. You can't yeah, push me out is, because I've already community. got my roots here. Okay. All right, y'all. This um that that was actually everything I had. We I don't know if y'all realize it, but we went through every <laughs> all 60 slides. Oh, I'm right. very, I'm very sorry for going on a couple rants. Oh no, nah. no! <laughs> why, why do you think I invited you? <laughs> we gotta let you have you. that sometimes, Trey. Whoo, boy! Yeah. You're right. You're right. Because I damn sure had to empty that clip out. I yes, feel so much did. better. <laughs> so, You're um, time to wrap up. Pardon shots. Who want to go first? Um, I go first. first. Thank you. Huh? Oh. Um. You know what? When you well, all those slides that you that you um, that you posted, and even the stuff that we know from my memory, we we have come a long way, right? We really have come a long way. We don't have to go to the colored water water fountain. We don't have to go to the colored bathrooms. We don't have to, you know, make sure we walk with our head down and say, you know, don't look, don't make no, don't make eye contact. Even though it is, it's, it's still, we got a long way to go. We've come a long way as well. Um, one thing I do want to make sure that when we say black excellence, that we make sure that we um, are, are proud of our blackness. It is not to um, to dumb down anybody else, but as you can see, that we have been a, we have been a, a people that have been held down for a very long time. There is much evidence to show that we have a reason to celebrate at this point. We still have some more celebrating to do. But we have come a long way, and that is okay for us to say I'm black and I'm proud, and to not be a, an insult to anybody else. 
At this point, we are still dealing with Karens and Connors that will still like to, to, to put you in a corner. But we are past those stages where we don't have to be put in a corner anymore. We don't have to be quieted. We don't have to be, you know, told to, you know, don't be so be, be so proud in your blackness. Those days are over. And if anybody ever tries to make you feel that way, then just shout it louder. Um, I wore this shirt today on purpose. It says, I am black. I'm a black woman, beautiful, magic, intelligent, resilient, love, innovative, positive, influential, and unapologetic. That's me. Right. Trey, I'm going to, I, I know you were the guest, but I'm going to go next. Okay. And I'm going to let you, after you, I'm going to let you end the, um, the parting shots. I'm gonna I'm gonna do the shout outs, but as far as like the speaking, I think you should go last, especially on this topic, even though you are a guest, okay? Thank you. All right. Um so I thought about this, I thought about this show like uh probably the, probably about a couple weeks, two or three weeks ago. I was like it's Black History Month. Uh, we have a platform that we can actually speak on Black History Month and do a tribute to Black History Month. Talk about the different topics. Um, I've always been a, I've, uh, me personally. I know Becky like nah. She like my spirit can't take it. I can't do it. She's one of those types because I watch every Black slavery racial movie TV show that comes out. I watch all of it, um, and not so much that I enjoy it or whatnot, but I love to keep myself in perspective. I love to make sure I appreciate my parents, my grandparents, my great grandparents. I love to be able to acknowledge what they went through and appreciate where I am at, what they went through to get me where the, the, the rights or the abilities um, all the privileges that I have right now. So it keeps me in perspective on why we vote, um, why there's certain things in the Black community that's important. Um, so 12 years of slave, um, roots, uh, Mississippi, Mississippi burning. I watch all, all those to kind of keep me grounded to remind me that, yes, we've come a long way, but that really was just 100 years ago. 200 years ago. My dad's 84 years old. So I'm just one generation removed from that shit. So yeah. that's not something that I should forget. I should never forget. I right, even if I don't like so I will always vote because people died for us to vote. People got hung for us to vote. So it's just certain rights that we've been given that sometimes I feel we may take advantage of because we didn't go through those things. Um, so that's why I was like, yo, we have the, we have the platform where we could talk about certain things. And I knew this wasn't going to be a, a high viewership, um, podcast night because this is one of the topics that people don't, um, like to hear, or like to talk about, but I still feel like, yo, it's important that we got a platform to talk about and speak on it. And that's why, um, I want to talk about it. And that's why I did the, the timeline from slavery to we have a black vice president woman, Kamala Harris, after a black president man, Barack mm -hmm. Obama. Um, so that's that's my part in shots. Um, just make sure we just don't take don't take for granted what we have, and make sure you appreciate what our black forefathers went through for us to have what we have. Trey, take us home. Uh, first and foremost, uh, Merv, thank you for having me on tonight. Um, I, I do appreciate being brought on here and, and getting to speak my mind and, and, and speak out on, on history and, and how it, how I've perceived it, um, throughout my life in another pod, I've, I've ex already explained, um, I've gone through my life having to fight and justify my my blackness um this is something that i i feel that we never that as a community we don't speak on enough 
Um, there, there, there is. I, I was actually really surprised in that slideshow that the the only athlete we we had one athlete that was spoken of, and that that happens so. The, the, the amount of times that that happens is so few and far between when you speak on black excellence and black history. Um, mm-hmm. and, and and I was <clears throat> shocked and, and I'm, I'm, I appreciate that fact because the black excellence that was highlighted tonight was black excellence and advancement of, of the community, black excellence in education, Black excellence and achievement as far as their position in the United States government, in in, in the United States military. Um, but I've, unfortunately, it had to be overshadowed by everything that we had to overcome to get to that point where it is considered black excellence. Um, so something that I, I have always tried to follow in, in not only my research of black history, but also the research of my family history. And I spoke on it a couple times tonight in AG Gaston was, was one of, one of those beacons of light in my life. And, and one quote that always sticks with me from him was we can't fight and beg from those we fight at the same time. You, you can't fight someone for your excellence. You can't fight somebody for your equality and then beg for handouts from them. You, you're gonna have to, you're gonna have to get up. You're gonna have to motivate yourself. You're gonna have to motivate your community. And, and on that, another quote from him is, money is no good unless it contributes to something in the community. Your money is doing absolutely nothing to advance who we are as a community, who we are as a people, if you're not spending it in places like the new Black Wall Street, if you're not spending it in Black-owned businesses, if you're not investing in Black-owned companies that that are online or or local. I, I I have fought too hard in my life to be considered black, to have somebody try to take that away from me. And something that I appreciate this podcast, every single one of you, is the fact that there was no, there was no questionnaire. There was no, well, did you go through this? It was, hey, we want you on. We want to hear your voice too. And the fact that you're provided, the fact that we're all provided that platform is, is an amazing thing to me. And hopefully with the number of people that are out there doing this, it will become a moment t- 10, 15, 20 years from now, the the internet revolution of the unity of black voices will be something that's brought up on somebody else's slideshow. And, and mm. And I, I appreciate, I appreciate history for what it is, but if you do not fight for history in the moment, it will never be history. That's true. So that that's my parting shot. Thank you for right. Shit, man. you got some gems on them. Drop, <laughs> drop some gems on them. <laughs> Right. We need a, 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 a gunshot sound effect. <laughs> <laughs> that motherfucker made me look up to the sky about three times. Like, damn, that was profound. <laughs> <laughs> Go back and watch it and then write it down, Merv. Hey, shit, for real. <laughs> God damn. Yeah, that hey, that's, hot. <laughs> <laughs> hey, that's why I let him take us on home, back. You feel me? That boy. Um, you know, I, I I appreciate y'all. I appreciate y'all coming on and help me um, to execute this vision that I had, and everything I thought about. Y'all brought it to life. Y'all brought everything to life of how I thought about this podcast to go. Um, I'm gonna give shout outs to Sean Stacks, uh, Mark, Tina B, Mel, Nick J. 
um sam all in our comments um people that follow us and that's watching us that we don't know that's watching us our facebook podcast group um blackjack tv channel 199 198 zingle tv mile high radio station blast music um also some of uh, sponsors that we work with behind the scenes everybody that's watching us supporting us and helping us facebook live youtube facebook live youtube live um everybody that's, <laughs> everybody no, that's helping us achieve black excellence everybody that's helping us and supporting us to achieve black excellence we thank y'all um salute again black history month and uh the so-called black history month is ending but black history excellence will continue to strive forever as it always has and on that note peace peace love and happiness (laughs)